presenter is Ricky Chen. Uh, he's one of the senior residents in neurology, and he's uh, going on to a fellowship in neuro-oncology. He's going to talk about papilledema. So thanks for having me here. Um, I'm going to share with you an interesting case of papilledema that I saw in neuro-ophthalmology when I rotated last month. Um, so this guy was a um, young man uh, from the Marines in uh, Washington, D.C. He presented um, to us two weeks after having developed uh, binocular diplopia. Um, and he recently had uh, been discharged from a military hospital um, in Washington back to Utah to recuperate from viral meningitis. But he was very nonchalant about it, just said, you know, I had a lot of headache and that all got better and um, they gave me some um, symptomatic treatments and uh, I was doing really well but then um, developed a diplopia and he didn't really even come in until um, he leaked some ice pack fluid over his eye because he had some headache and eye pain and he was rubbing it too hard and so he ended up going to the ED for that um, and then eventually referred to um, uh, ophthalmology outpatient uh, who diagnosed uh, cranial nerve 4 and 6 palsies and some disc edema so it was referred to neuro-ophthalmology at the time but really didn't have much um, other complaints. So we had to dig a little deeper um, and uh, talking um, specifically more about his um, uh, kind of uh, presenting illness. Um, he was healthy until March, really no medical problems. Um, and then in early March, he went to a wedding in Hawaii. Uh, we did, did, did some uh, deep um, snuba, which is like snorkeling going down under and uh, had some sushi and salad. Nothing really remarkable, but actually important to the history. Um, he then later, two weeks later, developed uh, otitis media, presumed, and was treated for, uh, for it with antibiotics. Um, just basically had some earache and fevers that all went away completely. Um, until the end of March, uh, he rede redeveloped fevers. He started having headache and neck pain. Um, and no visual symptoms. He ended up um, presenting to uh, Virginia uh, Hospital Center in um, Washington, D.C., where he spent three days. He had a CT head um, that was normal. Um, he had a lumbar puncture, which showed 270 whites, 85% um, monos, and 12% eosinophils, interestingly. Um, they didn't really comment on this. The only test they did was uh, EBV and HSV PCRs, and those were negative. Otherwise, they didn't do glucose or protein um, per the records that we found, and um, culture was negative. He also had some peripheral eosinophilia, only 4%, um, mild leukocytosis, and uh, they checked influenza, uh, which was negative. Um, and so they gave him a diagnosis of presumptive viral meningitis, gave him some tramadol and Zofran, sent him on his way back to Utah to recuperate. Um, and uh, he was in, uh, getting better over a week until he developed this uh, diplopia, which um, he described as both vertical and horizontal um, images. Uh, it was binocular and uh, rotated relative to each other, worst on left lateral gaze. His vision was otherwise crisp and good color and depth perception. Um, his uh, headaches and eye pain overall, like I said, had improved. He no longer was having fevers. Um, and no other significant past history or medications. On examination, we found that he was uh, 20, 20 on the right and 20, 25 on the left. Um, his pupils, aside from uh, mild anisocoria, which is slightly greater on the left, um, no RAPD was found, uh, both briskly reactive. Um, his visual fields were full. Um, his extraocular movements, uh, motility was pretty abnormal. He had um, bilateral obducens palsies, um, worse on the left gaze. And then he had significant esotropia up to 30 diopters, um, and uh, also a left hypertropia of two diopters, mild right head tilt. Um, the remainder of his exam, intraocular pressures, um, uh, anterior and posterior chambers were normal. Um, and the remainder of no exam uh, were normal, including reflexes, sensation, no weakness. Um, his visual fields showed an enlarged blind spot and some scattered kind of subtle um, deficits, but uh, overall not too bad. Um, and uh, on his fundoscopic exam, he had pretty severe papilledema, grade three to four, with cotton wool spots and microhemorrhages. Um, 
so then we were pretty concerned. This guy just recently had viral meningitis. They didn't really do a full workup. So we sent off to repeat the LP, um, expecting, you know, could this be um, uh, a worsening condition? Because his headaches weren't that severe. They weren't even really that positional. Um, but he did ha end up having um, increased ICP. He also had increased uh, white count of 500 um, with 61% eosinophils, which is markedly abnormal. Um, his MRV, which we did to rule out venous clots, was normal. And the MRI brain, I'll show you, had some uh, pretty significant findings. Um, his flare uh, showed these um, abnormal uh, regions of hyperintensity uh, near the perivascular spaces, and these were nodular enhancing. Um, you can see on the gadolinium. Um, kind of multifocal spots, also included in a little bit in the midbrain, uh, more subtle. Um, and then he had optic nerve uh, T2 signal, as well as some enhancement. Um, there was no stroke or other hemorrhagic um, findings. Uh, he later underwent also a CT scan that showed some peripheral ground glass. Uh, the radiologist read it as possible aspergillus or some other fungal infection. So this was pretty concerning. Um, obviously, he ended up spending more than a day in neuro-ophthalmology. He ended up going to neurology for um, two weeks and with an ID consult. Um, I won't bore you with all the details because this is a short talk. He had everything drawn. Um, and he had serial LPs. His pressures would range between 28 to 40s. Um, and his uh, white count was between uh, 2 to 400s uh, with persistent eosinophilia, again, up to 61%. Um, this really kind of persisted throughout his course, except the pressures would get better uh, after a drain, and then um, the next day he'd build up more, to, uh, more headache again, um, and then his pressures would go up again, and they'd drain it. And this went on for a long time. Um, ID really didn't recommend any uh, treatment for this, but we had kind of suspicions of what this could be. On the differential also was um, kind of cardiac uh, vegetations, um, possible vasculitis. Um, they, did have other uh, imaging modalities, CTA head and neck, echo, abdominal ultrasound were all normal, ruling out any vasculitis. Also, hepatic infection was ruled out and um, no evidence of uh, vegetations. The CT chest, as I mentioned, and then finally, because we don't have the test to really do the confirmatory testing for this uh, parasite, we ended up sending it to CDC. Um, so this is the, the actual culprit was, um, it's the number one cause of eosinophilic meningoencephalitis in the world. Um, it's a nematode worm. Actually, it was discovered in my hometown, in Canton province, China. Um, in 1935, uh, Chen um, found that this was a worm that was seen in um, the pulmonary arteries of rats. Um, the first infection was um, diagnosed in uh, 1945 in Taiwan. Um, and so it's a um, worm that can uh, usually live definitively in a rat um, and then um, through fecal transmission and goes into mollusks and snails. Um, and then uh, can, there, you know, there are a lot of places in the world, including uh, my hometown, we eat snails. Um, and sometimes the uh, undercooked um, snail meat um, is not such a delicacy. And um, the uh, you can get transmission through that as well as through um, leafy greens that are contaminated by snails. Um, and then they can also go into other hosts and seafood. Um, basically, uh, by human ingestion, um, you get into the pulmonary, um, you get into the portal system and then um, venously go into the pulmonary system and then through the left heart into the rest of the, the body. Um, specifically, mainly only causes disease in the brain. Um, and then um, the majority of cases, which were over a thousand now in the world um, since the 1930s, um, you get a eosinophilic uh, granulomatous inflammation when the worm travels to the brain and uh, lodges in the perivascular spaces uh, and gets killed. Um, and then alternatively, a separate syndrome develops uh, in rare cases um, in, uh, in the eye, and that can be uh, presenting as uh, eye pain, um, and uh, people have found uh, worms in the eye. This was extracted from a 22-year-old Vietnamese woman, uh, this 22-millimeter worm, and um, 
There's also, you know, they found um, cases of optic disc edema, some uh, prolonged visual evoke potentials, and gave a diagnosis of optic neuritis to some people. Um, but those are pretty rare. And uh, so the majority, um, you know, transmission is through these routes. And so in um, our case, our patient had a history of ingestion. He also had symptoms consistent with meningoencephalitis. So this would be one of the top um, uh, differentials if you have eosinophilia in the periphery as well as in the CSF greater than 10%. So you met that criteria and then you usually confirm it by ELISA or PCR confirmation. Um, the number one uh, alternative if someone has a similar um, kind of story is neuronactostomiasis, um, which is another worm that can uh, live in uh, snails and uh, seafood. And then um, alternatively, other causes the eosinophilic meningitis if the patient has risk factors, neurocystic psychosis, um, TB, toxo, crypto, and others. Um, but by far, this, uh, this uh, particular disease is, is more common. Um, and most cases actually resolve spontaneously. Um, they, the severe cases uh, could lead to coma and death, but those are very occasional. Um, treatment can be with uh, supportive measures like draining um, fluid to reduce ICP. Steroids appears beneficial in some studies, um, but there's really not that much um, studied about it. Uh, and in general, um, infectious disease recommends avoiding um, albendazole and mebendazole because of the potential for killing the worms and causing increased inflammation, which could worsen the condition. Surgical removal of the worms uh, endoscopically is um, can prevent further vision loss, but unfortunately the recovery of vision is limited um, in most cases. This is more of the delicacies, uh, lots of vegetables out in the open, and then um, some seafood and uh, some street stalls. So our patient um, had a pretty good outcome. Uh, diplopia improved with some diamox and prednisone. He was down to two diopters of esotropia, down from 30 and his visual fields were fully normalized. His headaches pretty much resolved. Uh, he's been seeing us several times now. It's been a, a month since he, he's been in the hospital. Um, so take home points from this mm -hmm. case is that, um, you know, it's really important when you have a case of papilledema to uh, look for alternative causes um, and uh, you might find something special in the CSF. Um, that's something to take home from this case and really digging deeper into the history and um, as they say, beauty rests in the eye of the beholder, or there could be parasites there as well. <laughs> Any questions?